Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Carlos Kenning, the IMU president. It is a pleasure for me to introduce our next plenary speaker, Larry Guth. Guth was born in New York. He got his undergraduate degree at Yale and his PhD degree at MIT under the direction of Tom Rutka. He's cur currently the Claude Shannon Professor of Mathematics at MIT. Good's far-reaching contributions to mathematics range from differential and symplectic geometry to harmonic analysis and combinatorics. His solutions of a number of central problems have helped shape these and related fields. His works in analysis combinatorics began with the introduction of novel tools from algebraic topology to attack a major and solved problem in harmonic analysis, the Kakeya conjecture. His breakthrough has been highly influential, leading the way by himself and others to attack many related problems in analysis, combinatorics, and discrete geometry. With Katz, he resolved a long-standing problem of Erdos concerning distances of points in the plane, and their new techniques have had a major impact in discrete geometry. With Bourguin, and later by himself, Guth made major advances on another central problem in harmonic analysis, the restriction conjecture, by devising a way of passing from multi-linear to linear estimates by induction on scales. This coupled with his techniques from the Kakeya problem re revitalized the area. With Burgen and Demeter, Guth resolved a fundamental problem in analytic number theory, the Vinograd of mean value conjecture and the theory of exponential sums. The solutions of the above central open problems have come with new tools and ideas that now constitute fundamental parts of the corresponding theories. Good has been widely recognized for his contributions to mathematics. A sample is, uh, Good was awarded the Salem Prize, a Simons Investigator Award, and the New Horizons in Mathematics Breakthrough Prize. He was also a co-recipient of the Clay Research Award. Good was elected Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and Fellow of the American Mathematical Society. In 2020, Good was a co-recipient of the Boucher Memorial Prize from the AMS and the recipient of the inaugural Mirza Hani Prize of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. In 2021, he was elected a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. The title of Larry Good's lecture today is Decoupling Estimates and Fourier Analysis. And here we go. Okay, well, thanks for the invitation to speak here. It's a big honor. Um, I want to talk with you today about a new method in Fourier analysis called decoupling. And when this method came out, it was a big shock to me. Um, so first of all, I was very impressed by the theorems that it proved, that they proved. But also, um, I was surprised by the methods that they used to prove those theorems. The tools that go into what we're going to talk about today are, are quite elementary, and I was surprised that, that people could prove such strong theorems with such elementary tools. Um, at the same time, when I first started studying it, it felt quite technical to me. Uh, even though the tools are elementary, they're arranged in a complicated way. There are very long equations and long computations. And so, you know, when I was first reading it, I would do these long computations and I would kind of check everything. And I said, well, that means it's true, but I didn't feel like I understood r that well why it was true. So I spent most of the last eight years trying to wrap my head around this technique. And for the last maybe five years, I've been trying to figure out how to explain how the methods work uh, to, to give like a big picture sense and to also to try to explain it to a broad audience. Um, so today I want to try to share that with you. Okay, so first, first we'll describe the area a little bit and we'll state a theorem, uh, but then we're going to spend actually a good, good chunk of the time um, trying to explore how the proofs work. Okay. Okay, so decoupling is a part of Fourier analysis. So actually, the first thing I want to talk with you about is um, what is Fourier analysis? So Fourier analysis, you might remember, is like the field where we write functions like this. We write it as the sum of f hat of n e to the 2 pi i n x. Uh, so why do we do that? Well, I like to think of it as taking a function and breaking it up into these building blocks, the e to the 2 pi i n x. And what's special about these building blocks um, they behave nicely when we do a bunch of fundamental things in math, like when we take the derivative of a function uh, or when we translate x. Those building blocks behave nicely. 
So a lot of problems that involve derivatives or that involve the translation structure of the real line, you can kind of naturally write them in this Fourier representation. So that's why we do Fourier analysis. But there's also, um, there are also some negative things about writing a function this way. For a lot of purposes, this representation is really hard to work with. Like if I want to find f of 2, I have to add up this whole series. There are many terms. The terms can have positive parts and negative parts and imaginary parts. So it's, it's often hard to tell by looking at a Fourier series if f of 2 is positive or negative or if it's big or small. Um, and that, that's not just a nuisance. There are actually deep, open problems about, about understanding things like that. And we'll, I'll show one to you in a little bit. Um, OK, so decoupling is a recently developed set of tools. And it helps to transfer information about f hat into information about f. And it's led to the solution of several longstanding problems in harmonic analysis and in PDE and in number theory. It was introduced by Tom Wolfe in 2000. And there was a breakthrough sort of um, sharp decoupling theorem by Bergan and Demeter in 2014. OK, so here's the, the plan for the day. I'm going to introduce one old problem, which was solved using decoupling. Um, and then we're going to talk through some of the ideas of the proof. OK, so this old problem is from analytic number theory. Um, it's, about, it's a connection between Fourier analysis and Diophantine equations. So in the circle method, you can encode the number of solutions to a Diophantine equation using Fourier analysis. And here's a sample problem that people have attacked in this way. So we're going to think about the number of integer solutions to this equation. So the equation, the equation is here. It says I have, I have two s variables, which are integers from 1 to capital N. And the sum of the kth powers of the first s numbers is equal to the sum of the kth powers of the second s numbers. That's the equation. And we fix s and k. And we want to understand asymptotically how many solutions do this equation have as the range capital N gets big. Okay, so that's a sample problem from about Diophantine equations. And Hardy and Littlewood worked on it using Fourier analysis. And so let, let me show you some of how. Um, so they, they encoded, and it's probably older than them, you can encode the number of solutions of this equation um, using Fourier series. So we're going to write e of x for e to the 2 pi i x. And then we take this sum. Um, sum of e of n to the kx. And our proposition is that the, this number of integer solutions we are talking about is equal to this integral, the integral of the norm of that function to the power 2s. And on the next slide, I'm going to sketch the proof of the proposition, which is a good example of how Fourier series interact with the, with the translation structure of the real line. OK, so here's how it works. So a basic observation is that if I have an integer m and I integrate e of mx from 0 to 1, if m is 0, then I get 1. But for any other integer, I get 0. OK. So then remember that h of x was this function, the sum of e of n to the kx. And I take the norm of h to the 2s, where s is an integer. And we expand it out. So it's h to the s times h bar to the s. Expand all that out, we get a sum of lots of terms. And they each have the form e of some frequency times x. And this frequency in orange you get by writing everything out and multiplying it together. Um, and it's the sum of the kth powers of the first s guys minus the sum of the kth powers of the next s guys. These first ones that are positive come from h to the s. And the next ones that are negative come from h bar to the s. OK. Then we're going to integrate that from 0 to 1. So it's a sum of a bunch of integrals. And they each have that form e of some frequency times x. So whenever that frequency is 0, we count that once. And whenever the frequency is not 0, it, it contributes nothing. So when I add this all up, I get the number of integer solutions. OK. OK, so that was the proof of the proposition. And Hardy and Littlewood used that to, to estimate the number of integer solutions of this equation. Here's the state of the knowledge roughly today. We understand the asymptotics in a couple of cases. Um, if k is 2, it's understood classically. Um, and also, it, we understand it if s is much bigger than k. And that was some of the main work of Hardy and Littlewood. 
and Vinogradov and other people. But for lots of particular values of S and K, we still have a very poor understanding of the asymptotics today, like if K is 3 and S is 3. Um, so for that, for that interesting choice of values, the number of solutions conjecturally should be around n cubed. And we know that it's in between n cubed and n to the 3.5. And we've known that for more than 60 years. And those exponents haven't moved in that time. OK. OK. So if you think about what we did as a Fourier analyst, um, when I wrote down the formula for this function h, what I wrote down was its Fourier series. And the thing that we're trying to compute, this number of integer solutions, is, is this integral. And basically, the issue here is that it's hard to go back and forth from this Fourier series, which is not such a complicated formula on the Fourier side, and to understand what this function looks like as a function of x well enough to give a reasonable estimate of the integral of the norm to some power. It's hard to go back and forth. Um, so here are two specific deep open problems estimate the order of magnitude of this function at some particular point, like square root of 2, or estimate this integral. OK. So for both of those that you know, we're, we have the wrong exponents. We have a range of exponents of what we know. And, um, and it's not a super small range, and, and it hasn't improved in a long time. OK. So there's a sample of deep open problems about translating information from what f hat looks like to what the function looks like as a function of x. OK. So now I'll tell you about the problem where recently there has been progress. It's a problem that was introduced by Vinogradov, and it looks similar, and it's related to the hardy little problem. And he, he suggested to study, he started to study the number of integer solutions of a system of equations. So there are k different equations. Um, indexed by j going from 1 to k. And the jth equation says that if I sum up the jth powers of my first s integers, it's equal to the sum of the jth powers of the next s integers. So now I have two s variables like before, but I have k equations instead of just one. And so, so this is, so he studied the number of integer solutions of this system. And one of his insights is that this system is actually easier to get your hands on than the Hardy-Littlewood equation. And he was able to prove sharp estimates for many more choices of s and k. Um, and on the next slide, I'll show you one of the results that he got this way. OK. So I mentioned to you earlier that Hardy and Littlewood, that, that we understand the asymptotics of the Hardy-Littlewood system if s is, quote, much bigger than k. Let's make that a little more quantitative. Um, Hardy and Littlewood and Hua were able to prove good asymptotics if s is bigger than 2 to the k. And Vinogradov improved that a lot by using his ideas about the, the Vinogradov system. And he improved it to s is bigger than a constant k squared log k. And in all the time since Vinogradov, there have been some further improvements, which are not nearly as dramatic. But now we understand if s is bigger than about k squared over 2. OK. So that was one sample application that he got. Um, he did some other neat things also as a corollary of, of his work on that system. Uh, like, for instance, he, he improved our understanding of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function and the error term in the prime number theorem. OK. Um, <clears throat> so Vinogradov studied the number of integer solutions to this system. And he proved good estimates for a lot of k and s, but not all of them. Um, and now in the last decade, mathematicians have proven good estimates for all k and s for any k and any s, systematically, we, can, we have the right order of magnitude. Um, so here's the statement of the theorem. Um, <clears throat> so for every epsilon bigger than 0, there's some constant, so that the number of solutions is at most, um, this is the main term here, times a constant n to the epsilon. So this is like a fairly small factor. And this is the main term. And the upper bound is sharp up to this small factor. In other words, the number of solutions is at least this much. <coughs> um, so the number of solutions basically grows like a polynomial in n. And this is a way of saying we, we, have, we now have the right degree of that polynomial, although there's some like subpolynomial terms that aren't totally sorted out. OK. Um, there are now several proofs of this theorem. Um, Woolley proved it in, for k equals 3. And Brigan and Demeter and myself proved it for all k using this idea of decoupling 
and then Woolley proved it for all K. And then Guo, Li, Yang, and Zoran Kranich proved it also for all K, combining all these ideas, and they made a really concise proof. It's only 10 pages long. Okay. So this is the main theorem that I'm going to tell you about, uh, that I'm going to tell you about the, the proof of. Okay. Okay. So the main goal of the talk is to describe some of the ideas of the proof. And as I mentioned earlier, all the proofs involve complex formulas and computations. And we're going to try to explain kind of the ingredients or the ideas that go into them without writing the long formulas. Um, and I'm going to focus on the decoupling proof, which is the one that I know the best. Um, but some of the comments, some of the, um, some of the ideas are common to all of the proofs, and I'll try to talk about that a little bit. Okay, I wanted to pause before we start to look at the proof um, to compare the hardy littlewood problem and the Vinogradov problem. So I came from Fourier analysis, and I didn't know a lot of number theory. And when I first looked at these two problems, uh, if you had asked me which of them was harder, I wouldn't have had really any idea. And I probably would have guessed that the Vinogradov problem was harder because it looks more complicated and there are more equations in it. So, so first, let me just compare them. So the hardy littlewood system, there's just one equation. So two s variables and one equation. And in the Vitor-Gradov system, there are k equations. So you look at the sum of the jth powers for all the different j's. OK. And the hardy littlewood system is harder. It's a wide open problem for many values of k and s, whereas the Vitor-Gradov system, we understand systematically for all the k and all the s. So it's natural to ask here, why is the Vitor-Gradov system easier to understand? Um, and basically, the reason is that it's, um, it's well set up for doing induction on n. Or another way to say it is for, for combining information from different scales. Like if I tell you that there's some good estimate for the Vinogradov system when capital N, which is the range of our numbers, goes up to 10 to the 10, you can input that in a natural way to help figure out what happens when capital N goes up to 10 to the 100. And there's no nice way to do that in the hardy littlewood system. And that's basically what makes them different. And that observation goes back to Vinogradov. He used it heavily in the 1930s. And it's continued to be central. It's even more central in the recent proofs. They're all based heavily on that idea. OK. Um, so by the end of the talk, we'll come back to this combining multiple scales, and we'll see how it works in the Fourier analysis. OK. So we're going to approach it using, uh, we're going to approach the Vinogradov system using Fourier analysis. And you can write this JSK of n as an integral. It's an integral over a cube of some function to the 2s. And I won't write down the function right now, but it has a simple Fourier series similar to the one that we were looking at for the Hardy Littlewood. Um, OK. Now, we cannot estimate the norm of f of x, the norm of this function, for a given point. That problem is just as hard or harder than the hardy littlewood problem. Um, but we can estimate the moments of this function. In other words, the integral of the norm of f to the p. We can do that actually for any exponent p. OK. <clears throat> so I wanted to make some, some comments about the proof. Um, so in the decoupling proof, we're going to estimate this integral using purely analytic methods. Um, so some of the number theory, some, you know, it's a number theory problem, and people have also have attacked it using number theory. So some of the proofs involve things like unique factorization of the integers or something like that. We don't, we, none of that will be involved in this decoupling proof. Uh, the ingredients are things like orthogonality and Holder's inequality and um, elementary geometry and induction on scales. And it may be surprising that these ingredients are enough to prove sharp estimates for this Vinogradov system. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, so, so Bergan and Demeter proved a slightly different thing. They proved sharp LP estimates for some different exponential sums. And when I read that, I was really surprised that they could do that with just these tools. Um, of course, most of the tools in this list are very old. Um, and the tool that kind of was more powerful than people had realized that, that, that played a big role is this induction on scales tool. So I'll put that in red. Um, so one of the goals for the talk is to explain what this means, this combining information from many scales, and talk about why it's helpful. 
OK. And the last comment about the proof is that the proof is actually pretty visual. And we're going to draw a lot of pictures. And at the beginning, we're going to choose a coordinate system that makes these pictures uh, nice. And also, to keep the discussion simple, I'm going to focus on a simple case. So k, the exponent that we raise the numbers to, is just going to be 2. Um, and I'm going to prove something a little bit weaker, but it's going to show the ideas that go into the proof. OK. Um, so <clears throat> let's make a uh, concrete question of, uh, of Fourier, Fourier analysis. So I'm going to introduce a particular exponential sum, and we're going to prove a, or talk about the proof of a particular estimate about it. OK, so, um, so the variable x is going to be in, in R2, so it's x1, x2. And this is our exponential sum. It's the sum as little over little n of, remember that e of x is an abbreviation for e to the 2 pi i x. This is the sum, little n over big N times x1 plus little n squared over big N squared times x2. Now these things in the denominators, um, those, are, those are basically my choice of coordinate system. Number theorists leave them out. Um, and they, they, they make the formula a little bit uglier, but they're going to make the pictures look nicer. And that's why they're there. OK. So each one of these is, is a complex exponential. It has the form e of some frequency dotted with x. That's the frequency. And the, each, the, it's a two-dimensional complex exponential, so each frequency is a vector. And uh, so the vectors are little n over big N, comma, little n squared over big N squared. Those are the frequencies. And notice that all of those frequencies lie on a parabola. Omega 2 is equal to omega 1 squared. And that structure of the parabola is going to be crucial to analyzing this exponential sum. OK. <clears throat> um, I'm going to write q sub s of x. That means a square of side length s. With, and centered at x. And to get sharp estimates for our Wiener Grotup system of degree 2, it boils down to an integral of the norm of f to the sixth over a square, q of side length n squared. So this is the thing that we have to estimate. Um, OK. And before we start to estimate it, I want to take a minute to try to visualize this function, this exponential sum. Um, Basically, all the estimates for the exponential sum boil down to being able to visualize it well. If you have a good, you know, a good model of this function, you can estimate its integral or the integral of the function squared or whatever. Um, OK, so what can, we, what can we figure out about this function f by looking at this formula? Well, we can plug in a few values, and the easiest value is 0. If x is 0, then this is 0, so each of these terms is 1, so f of 0 is capital N. And that's the biggest that f could be by the triangle inequality. Um, we have that the norm of f of x is always at most n. But it's usually a lot smaller than that. Intuitively, you know, we, we're adding up all these unit complex numbers. And for a typical x, they're all over the circle, and they cancel each other a lot. And because of orthogonality, we can say that the norm of f is typically smaller than 10 square root of n. So orthogonality lets us estimate um, uh, it lets us estimate the integral of the norm of f squared. We can evaluate that. Um, and if you do a little computation, then you see that the typical value of the norm of f is like square root of n and not like n. OK. Um, another thing we can see from the formula is that the function f is periodic in the x1 variable with period capital N. If I add capital N to x1, this will change by an integer, so this won't change at all. Uh, OK. So we'll start to draw a picture here. So we care about what f looks like on an n squared by n squared square. So there's a picture there. And I know that f of 0 is capital N, which is really big. So I'll color that with a red dot. Um, so these red dots represent places where the norm of f is, is, is really big. Um, OK. And it's periodic in the x1 variable with period n. So it's also really big here and here and here and here and so on. And also, if you move x just a teeny bit, this function is continuous, so it's not going to change very much. And uh, quantitatively, if you move x by around by less than 1, 
then it's, the function won't change very much. So it's also quite big on all of these, on a unit ball around each of those red dots. Okay, but typically it's much smaller, it's around square root of n. So if you imagine that you're looking down at this thing, you'll see some very tall peaks at these red dots. You'll see a typical height that's much smaller than that, like square root of n. And that's what we, then, then there, may or, there may or may not be some other place, other peaks of, of various other heights, which is kind of what it's all about figuring out. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so the subject is all about figuring out um, what other peaks this function has, or at least roughly how many peaks it has at various heights. So let's give that a name. So u sub lambda of f are the points x where the norm of f is bigger than lambda. We'd like to understand that set. And uh, we'd like to understand its area. So the norm of u will denote the measure of u. So really, we'd like to understand for every height lambda, how big is u lambda of f? But just to give a typical interesting one, um, what if lambda is about as big as possible? So lambda is n over 10. How big is the set? where f has size bigger than n over 10. What does that set look like? And uh, a theorem, which is a baby version of the, of the integral estimate that we need to prove, um, says it should be not much bigger than n. So c epsilon n to the 1 plus epsilon. So that's the estimate that, that we're going to talk about together. And notice, for comparison, that we've already identified these red dots where our function is really big. It has size n. And the total area of those red dots is n. So that almost matches this upper bound. So we have to prove, basically, that there's, not, there's hardly any more places where the function is that big besides the places we've already found. OK. OK, so we have a concrete exponential sum, and we have a concrete estimate. Um, and that's the type of estimate that goes into, into Vinogradov, proving this bound about the Vinogradov system. OK. Um, so here I have a summary of all the notation that we talked about. And um, I'll let you look it over for a minute um, and make sure that the problem that we're going to work on together is clear. And then I'm going to introduce you to the tools from Fourier analysis, the old tools and the new tools that go into studying this. So any questions or comments before we go on? OK. OK. So, so we're going to try to prove this together. And I'm going to introduce one tool at a time from the field. And, uh, and each time we have a new tool, we'll see how far it gets us. Um, OK. Um, so the first tool I, I introduce is orthogonality is maybe the most fundamental tool in Fourier analysis. Um, so these different complex exponentials with different frequencies, they're all orthogonal to each other. And it's not that hard to check that they're orthogonal to each other on any cube of side length capital N. Um, you just take one times the complex conjugate of the other, and you explicitly integrate it on one of those cubes, and you get 0. So they're orthogonal. And that lets us estimate. Um, so or let's just compute um, the integral on any one of these cubes of the norm of f squared. It's actually the same on any cube of side length capital N, and we can compute it exactly. Um, and uh, actually, I'll even tell you what it is. Um, it's there are n terms, one for each complex exponential, and they each contribute the area of the cube. Okay. And we can use that to estimate how often the function is really big on each cube. So if I look at u n over 10 of f, which remember that's the place where f has size at least n over 10, on a cube of side n, that's at most a constant times n. Um, OK, and then that's true for each small square. And so we can use that and put it together. So there are n squared. Actually, let's look at the picture now. So now I'll, I'll try to draw a picture of what we know. So this is the n, this n squared by n squared square. And in red, I'll draw what our set un over 10 of f might look like. And what I know about it is that 
inside of each small square, there's at most this much of it. And then inside the big square, I can just add that up. So we get a bound of n cubed for how big this set is, just from orthogonality. And that's much bigger than the bound we want to prove of n to the 1 plus epsilon. So really what this red, this, this red set should look like is one red dot uh, in each square along the bottom. OK, so that's what we get from orthogonality. How can we do better than that? It really takes a significant amount of thought to do better than orthogonality. Um, the next tool that I want to introduce is to take the sum and break it into pieces. So instead of trying to add up all of it at once, if I have some interval i in the numbers from 1 to n, I can take fi of x, where I just sum up the exponentials in that interval. And I can take the whole numbers from 1 to n, and I can partition it into a bunch of intervals of some length l. And then my whole function is the sum over the intervals of length l of f sub i of x. The whole f is a sum of a bunch of f sub i of x. And, and, and this, this is actually crucial. All the theorems about the Vinogradov system, all the proofs, they involve looking at these f sub i's for many different i's with many different lengths, um, and proving estimates about, about all of those individually. Okay. Um, so here's a simple observation. Um, if x is, if f of x is really big, if x is in un over 10 of f, which means f of x is almost as big as it could be, then x should be in ul over 20 of fi for most of the i's. It's elementary, and here's the proof idea. So f is a sum of n terms of size 1, so it has norm at most n. And f sub i is a sum of only l terms of size 1, so it has norm at most l. And the number of different i's is n over l. So if I knew that the norm of f of x was n, the only way that could happen is that the norm of f sub i would have to be l for every, every one of these i's. And similarly, if the norm of f is close to n, then the norm of f sub i should be close to l for most of the i's. It's the only way that could happen. OK, so that suggests a strategy or some questions. We could ask, what can we say about each of these sets, ul over 20 of fi? What can we say about the set where fi is big for each i? And then what can we say about how those sets overlap with each other? So let me make a little visual. Um, if, uh, you know, if this is fi1 and this is fi2, um, then fi, uh, uh, sorry, u, this is u of fi1. So this is where fi1 is big, and this is where fi2 is big. The place where f is big has to be where they're both big in there. So if I know, understand the shape of the purple thing and the green thing for all the different options, and if I understand how they overlap, that will help me understand um, this set. OK. So that brings up uh, a question. What can we say? So what, what can we say about each of those shapes? We're going to focus on this for a little bit. Uh, what can we say about the shape of f sub i? OK. So let's look at the frequencies that we're contributing to f sub i. So we're looking at the frequencies little n over big n, little n squared over big n squared, where little n is in this interval i. So those are some these integer points on the, or these rational points on the parabola along an interval. And they all lie in a little box that I've drawn in red here. So in other words, fi hat, the Fourier transform of fi, is supported in this small box. You could ask, what does that tell us about fi itself? That goes back to an old, some old questions in Fourier analysis. So before I tell you the answer to this, which is a little bit involved, I'm going to do a warm-up problem with you. So, Here's our warm-up problem. Suppose that g is a function on the real numbers, and g hat is supported in a, in a small interval from minus a half to a half. What does that tell you about the function g? So to, to, to let you think about it for a second, I drew a blue function and an orange function. And I want you to think which one of those functions has a Fourier transform that's supported between minus a half and a half. Um, so the answer is the blue function has g hat supported between minus a half and a half, and the orange function doesn't. 
And the difference, the telltale sign, is these sharp peaks in the orange function. A function with sharp peaks cannot have a Fourier transform supported in a small interval. Um, the sharp peaks require a whole, a whole range of, uh, a big range of, of Fourier support in order to make them. Um, and this comes up in a few parts of, of math and science. Um, one place where it comes up is in information theory. So in the context of understanding how much information that you can transmit through a band-limited channel, um, Shannon, building on earlier work by Nyquist, proved the following theorem. If I have a function g, and g hat is supported in minus a half comma a half, then you can recover the function g if you just know g of n for every integer n. Um, and in the, the proof is it gives an explicit recipe, but an informal recipe that's more or less correct is the following. Um, you take your function, you, you're given g of 1, g of 2, g of 3, g of 4, g of 5, and so on. So you're given those red dots, and we have to graph the whole function. And you like draw a nice smooth curve that goes through them. And that's basically what the function will look like. Um, OK, and, and the orange function fails this test, because if I know it at the integer values, and I draw a nice smooth, um, a nice smooth function that goes through those values, it doesn't look like the orange function. So the shannon nyquist theorem strongly suggests that a, ba a function with Fourier transform supported between minus a half and a half shouldn't have a sharp peak like that. Um, OK. And so heuristically, what's behind this is that if, we, if g hat is supported in this small interval, then g shouldn't change very much on any unit interval. So what we like to say in, in the Fourier analysis world is that g is roughly constant on each interval of length 1. Like, say, between 3 and 4, g is roughly constant there. OK. Now, I intentionally said something heuristic here instead of something precise, uh, because the precise statement is a little technical and a little ugly. Um, but, but this is something that we all work with in our heads, and then at some point we write down some more technical things when we need to do so. Okay. So that was our warm-up problem, a function of one variable where the Fourier transform is supported in an interval. Now let's remember the situation that we were looking at. We were looking at this function fi, and its Fourier transform was supported in this little rectangle. Right. What does that tell us about fi? Well, there's an analog. There's an analog of the Shannon-Nyquist theorem, and there's an analog of the heuristic that this function should be kind of locally constant on some appropriate building blocks. So here's what it looks like. Um, because fi, because fi hat is supported on this little rectangle, the norm of fi is approximately constant on each rectangle in this tiling over here. OK, now I'm going to tell you how to draw this tiling in a second. But modulo that, I want to check that it's clear what we're talking about. This is one of the, I don't know, trickiest things to say that I have to say. OK, cool. OK, so how do we draw this tiling over here? Well, if um, this blue rectangle on the left in Fourier space, if that had just been a unit square, then this would just be a tiling by unit squares. But it's not. It's a kind of eccentric rectangle. So I have to tell you um, how, how these rectangles are related to this one. Um, and basically, they're dual to it. Um, and so that means the following thing, that um, this axis here, first of all, this axis here is in the same direction as that axis over there. And the length of this axis is 1 over the length of that axis. And similarly, the length of this axis is 1 over the length of that axis. Um, and you know, to, to prove it with these funny shapes is really not any harder than proving it with unit squares. You can think of it as just performing a change of variable, a linear change of variables on your space. And this is what happens. OK. Um, so that's what we know about the shape of each fi. Let me pause to summarize, because we've said a lot of things. Um, so we've, we've talked through three tools that we could use to analyze this function. And in a moment, we're going to combine them all. Um, so the first tool is orthogonality. The, these exponential building blocks are orthogonal on each qn. 
And that means that I can take the integral on Qn of, of the norm of Fi squared. I can compute all of those things. And I can look at the different, I can, I can look at Fi's with different, um, for different intervals i. And I know that if my function, if my whole sum is big at some point x, then most of those partial sums should also be big. And then I know something interesting about the geometry of each partial sum. I know that the norm of Fi is roughly constant on some big rectangles that come from a tiling that's dual to i. Actually, it's important that they're big. Let me rewind for a second. Um, so, you know, if I had taken all of the dots along this whole parabola, then the corresponding box would be like this. It would cover, the, it would be like a whole square. And that would tell me um, that my, so that actually that would be the unit square. So if I take the whole function f, then the, uh, its Fourier support is contained in the unit square. And that would tell me that the norm of f is roughly constant on each unit square. But as I take shorter intervals i, I get much stronger information about the support of f i hat. So it's supported in these smaller and smaller rectangles. And as these rectangles in Fourier space get smaller, I have you know, a stronger information about the support. And it gives me a better locally constant. It makes these rectangles very big uh, over in physical space. So the norm of f i is constant on a really large rectangle uh, in physical space. OK, so it's actually a lot of information about how f i is shaped. And the smaller the interval i is, the stronger that information is. OK, so each f each fi has an interesting shape. The norm of fi is roughly constant on each rectangle, each pretty big rectangle that's dual to i. And if I look at a set like the set where fi is bigger than something or another, it's basically going to be a union of some of those rectangles, because the size of fi is constant on each of those rectangles. It's going to be organized into these big blocks. OK, so we're going to try to combine all of those tools and see what we can figure out. And let me give you another moment to look over them. That's a summary of a lot of information that we've thought through. Okay. Okay. So let's put that together. We can start to draw some pictures. Um, so an interesting length to look at is n to the 1 half. Um, so orthogonality tells us how big any of these sets are in a cube of side length n. So if you compute, you'll see that the, the, the size of the set where fi is really big in an n cube, in an n square, is bounded by that. And we also know that this set ul over 20 is organized into rectangles with certain dimensions, which you can work out to be n to the half by n. And this n to the 3 halves, it matches this n to the half by n, and it tells us that inside of each square, qn, there's only order of one rectangles where this thing is big. So now we can make a picture. In Fourier space, we have the interval i, so fi hat is supported there. And in physical space, I drew what ul over 20 of fi might look like. And I drew a bunch of these rectangles. Each of them is dual to this one. Um, and there's at most one of the rectangles per n by n square. So that's what ul over 20 of fi might look like by combining the tools that we have so far. OK. So that's what each one of them looks like. And there is a punchline that comes by thinking about what they all look like. So instead of just doing that for one i, I'm going to do it for all the different i's. And I get um, this picture that I have enjoyed staring at for the last 10 years. OK, so, so notice that as we move along the parabola, the tangent direction of the rectangle is changing. Um, so the orientation of the different rectangles for i1, i2, and i3 are changing. And that means the orientation for the dual rectangles is changing. Um, so here in light blue, I've drawn what, um, uh, here, in, here in purple, I've drawn what ul over 20 of the i1 function might look like. It's at most one rectangle per square, as we talked about before, and they're the purple rectangles. 
And in green, I've drawn what UL over 20 of I3 might look like at most one rectangle per square, with the green ones, and they face a different way. Okay. And that's going to help us, because remember that if x is in un over 10 of f, if f of x is really big, then x should be in ul over 20 of f i for most of the i's. In other words, it should be in a point that, that, that it should be in a rainbow point, a point that's covered by all the different colors. Okay. So in this picture, where might un over 10 of f be? Um, you know, inside of this square, there isn't really anywhere, but a typical kind of place where it could be is it could be in there or it could be in there, uh, or it could be in there. Those are the only places where it could live. It could only live in places where all these different colored rectangles are overlapping. And there's a new thing that's kind of helping us here, is that it's not so easy for these different colored rectangles to overlap heavily because they are pointing in different directions. You know, if you have two rectangles in different directions, it's not easy for them to overlap heavily. Okay. Um, So, okay, so, so actually un over 10 of f intersect qn is contained in, if, so if, you, if, you, if we focus on one square of side length n, inside of there, un over 10 of f has to lie in a rectangle of every color, so it has to lie in basically just one much smaller square. Okay. And you can, you can use that. This smaller square doesn't have side length 1. It has side length square root of n. So it, there's actually stuff going on inside of there. But you can zoom in on it. and You can study it with the same method. Um, and what comes out of that analysis is, that, is, is this estimate here. u over 10 of f intersected with a square of side length n has size basically 1. that there's only in this whole square, like a single unit square, a single unit ball, um, where the function is really big. And that's, that's true for each small square, so you can add them all up, and you get, we get a new stronger bound for um, the set where f is really big, which is closer to n, which is basically n squared. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of this idea. Um, the, the transversality between the rectangles is just the new tool that let, let us get a, a better bound. Um, and it depends on the fact that the parabola is curved. And this goes back to a program that Eli Stein initiated in the 1960s, investigating the connection between curvature and Fourier analysis. And it was developed by many people. And the particular argument that I just showed you um, is due to Bennett, Carberry, and Tao, and it was influenced a lot by the work of Tom Wolfe on decoupling. Um, let's also take stock. Um, so we have this particular exponential sum. We're trying to estimate the area of the set where it's really big. By just orthogonality, we got an easy bound of n cubed. And we had to work really quite hard to beat n cubed. Um, and using also combining orthogonality and this idea of transversality, we got a bound of n to the n squared, basically. And that was the best bound that existed in, in Fourier analysis. Um, in harmonic analysis before the work of Bourdain and Demeter. Um, so that, so that I was hedging my words here a little bit. So the, this particular theorem that we're talking about has a slick number theory proof. Uh, one such proof uses unique factorization. Um, so it was known a long time ago. Um, but the harmonic analysis proof is inherently more general. Um, so instead of taking, so we took an actual parabola and we took these, these points on it. But you could take, um, in, as far as the harmonic analysis is concerned, you could take a, just a nice convex curve and take frequencies on that. Um, and everything we've said so far would work as well for the convex curve. But the special number theory things wouldn't make any sense at all. Um, so in, in this more general setting, this was the best bound that was known um, before the recent work of Bergan and Demeter. Um, and it seemed very plausible to me and other people that it was the best bound that was true. And it seemed like it would be very difficult to do better than it. 
Um, so as a harmonic analysis, uh, as a harmonic analysis a analyst, here's what was uh, scary to me. So the worst case situation here is that in each of these, um, in each of these n by n squares, there's somewhere a unit square where our function is really big. And it, sh it should be in, you know, inside of a rectangle of every color. And the truth is that only on the bottom row, our function f has one of those red squares. And all of these other ones don't exist. So to prove something like that, we have to get these big squares to talk to each other. We have to say you know, that if something really big happens here and there, then it shouldn't also happen there. Um, and um, in all the kinds of estimates we've talked about so far, it, it seems like it would be difficult to get them to communicate with each other. OK. Um, <clears throat> OK, so we were stuck there. And there was one more idea that put us over the hump, which is now the main idea of decoupling. Um, it's the tool of induction on scales. So we discussed how to estimate. In, in the argument that we had already, we looked at f sub i for lots of different i's. And we thought, how are we going to estimate f sub i? And how are we going to estimate the set where it's big? And if you pause to reflect on that for a moment, it's really a lot like our original problem. f sub i is some exponential sum. And we're asking about the set where it's big. And we'd like to know its area. It's a lot like our original problem. Um, in, in fact, it's even equivalent to our original problem. So for any i, there's a change of variables that converts that to our original problem for an exponential sum of L terms. And what that means is that we could use all the tools that we use to study f, and we can use it to study just fi. And it will tell us some things about fi that we didn't know before, that we didn't mention in the argument that we just made. So, if you look back at the argument that we just made, for each fi, the only thing that we did to control it is we used local orthogonality. But you could also apply either induction, or you could apply like the whole argument I just told you. You could apply all of that to each fi, and it would give you a new bound on how big this set is. And these two bounds are actually kind of complementary to each other. Because local orthogonality works on a ball of side n. I think this is on the next slide. Um, local orthogonality tells us how big this set is on each small square. And our induction argument will tell us how big it is on the big square. They're complementary to each other. So on the one hand, we still know, like we already knew, that ul over 20 has at most one rectangle per small square. But now we also know how big it is in total. And it is not big enough to have one rectangle in every square. It's only big enough to have one rectangle in a rather small fraction of the squares. So it looks like that, not like the picture we had before. And that's a big improvement in our knowledge. And we can just stick it in to combine it with the argument we had already. So we can still have all of the different colors um, and um, this the set un over 10 of f has to lie in a rectangle of every color. Uh, and there's a lot fewer places like that, just because for each color there are fewer rectangles. OK. And then you have to compute to see how good this, how well this does. But th this one new idea, when you add it in, it takes our bound all the way to the goal. It gives you n to the 1 plus epsilon. So I'm just going to now re so that was, that was the big idea. We have now, I've now shared with you as best as I can the big idea of the proof of decoupling. And I'm just going to recap and then see if there are any questions. OK. So we tried three. Uh, we, had, we had three bounds. The first bound, we just used orthogonality, and we got a bound of n cubed. Then we combined orthogonality with the transversality of these rectangles, which gave us a bound of basically n squared. And that, that bound captures ideas from harmonic analysis of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then we added to that this idea of induction on scales, of using, this, using um, the same method to study each fi that we used to study all of f. 
And when we, that, that idea comes from the decoupling theory. Wolf was using that idea, and Bergan and Demeter were using it kind of optimally. Um, and it gives the, the basically sharp bound of n to the 1. OK. And I wanted to reflect for a minute about why that induction step helped us. Um, so when we did the orthogonality and transversality argument, we looked at f sub i for one length scale l. L is the number of terms in, in i. We happen to pick the one n to the 1 half. And we looked at that one length scale, and the f sub i were organized into rectangles. And then we took advantage of the transversality of those rectangles. Now, when you use induction, so first when I was reading these induction arguments, I was, it's, it's, the induction is somehow confusing. So I tried to sort of unwind the induction. And when you unwind the induction, you see that it involves some length scales L to the alpha for other values of alpha. And in fact, if you fully unwind it, you get L to the alpha for a dense set of values of alpha. And for every one of these scales, you will see um, intervals i with, with that length scale. And there will be rectangles that go with them. And there will be transversality of those rectangles being used. So basically, the difference is that instead of just taking advantage of transversality at one length scale, we are now taking advantage of transversality at every length scale. And that's where the extra um, leverage is coming from. OK. Um, OK. So, um, so that's, that's, that's what I have been able to come up with in the last so far to describe how this decoupling proof works and the ideas that go into it. Um, thank you for having me and for your attention. And let's stop there. Well, that was something. Thank you very much, Larry. That was extremely illuminating. And uh, if there are questions for Larry, uh, please go to Discord and he will uh, attempt to answer them there. Okay. Thank you for having me. This was, uh, I mean, it's really special to be here. Thank you, Larry. And uh, well, we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye.